Hi, I'm Dr. Cyrus McCandless, uh, Chief Science Officer at Sentient Decision Science. I have uh, training in uh, experimental psychology, personal psychology, uh, behavioral neuroscience, uh, cognitive and computational neuroscience, and my PhD in uh, neurobiology, specifically systems, vestibular neurophysiology, and wake animals uh, from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And for the past 15 years, uh, I've been applying uh, methods and technologies from behavioral sciences to the study of consumer behavior in the real world. About five years ago, I got a chance to go back to my roots in computational neuroscience and build sentience expression models, uh, large deep learning neural network based models uh, for automated facial expression recognition for use in the testing of television advertisements. Marketing and advertising are probably about as old as written language itself, but it was really only at the beginning of the 20th century that we started to look at marketing and advertising as something that could be measurable. Uh, we wanted to understand the impact of our marketing efforts. And at the beginning, these were very crude measures. Uh, for example, just asking people how they felt about a message or a piece of marketing, and eventually coming up with ways of asking questions about how marketing and advertising might actually affect their purchase behavior or other kinds of behaviors. And people have come up with more and more sophisticated ways of measuring the impacts that advertising has on people's attitudes and likelihood to purchase uh, products or engage with services. Um, but we've had this big hole in our understanding of what marketing and advertising are, are doing, which is how the creative material is being received in real time in the moment. Uh, people have started off uh, looking at ways of measuring real-time behavior or real-time uh, response to advertising uh, with things like biomeasures, so uh, galvanic skin response, um, heart rate measures, um, and things like that. Now, these give some crude indication of whether or not a, a narrative or a piece of creative is engaging, uh, but they don't give you a lot of fine-grained detail, and people have went uh, toward the end of the century, began looking at more and more sophisticated ways of gauging real-time response to um, narrative or to media, going so far as to do things like eye tracking, um, followed by uh, EEG, which is a relatively powerful tool that gives you some, some crude insight into what's happening inside of the brain, uh, but it requires a laboratory. People have also gone so far as to uh, conduct fMRI studies um, to understand exactly what parts of the brain are responsive to creative in real time. And I got to do a little bit of that as well. But again, that's another methodology that requires uh, an enormous investment in facilities and time, but it, it critically, it also requires your audience to come to you. So all of these methodologies that we've talked about so far for engaging real time response to uh, creative, um, they, they get us to the point where we can fill in that, um, that hole in our understanding, uh, but those are all coming from samples that are sourced locally, and it costs quite a bit to bring people in. Um, and by definition, if you're running something like an fMRI study, um, then you have to source your sample from your local environment. And so for marketers and advertisers, that means that that, that sort of uh, real-time engagement data uh, cannot possibly be representative of the full population that they wish to reach in the, the larger world. So what else can we do? Well, since the late 70s, um, the facial action coding system developed by uh, uh, Paul Ekman, uh, William Friesen, and Erica Rosenberg, and several other people over the time, finally uh, began the rigorous and disciplined academic study of the facial musculature and whether or not um, there was information contained in movements of the face that communicates something about someone's internal state. Over the course of the last 40 years or so of research, movements of the facial musculature have been definitively shown to correlate to internal emotional states. Now, it's not a perfect correlation, um, but it is uh, extremely useful information um, for any individual emotion ranging anywhere from about 60 to uh, 85 percent in terms of what can be um, seen on the face when applying uh, the facial action coding system uh, rigorously by a, a trained uh, FACS coder. And since the 
early 21st century, actually coming out in uh, 98 or 99 with uh, Jeff Cohn's paper. Uh, finally, machine learning algorithms and computer vision uh, was getting to the point of being able to achieve uh, human FACS coder level accuracy uh, in terms of recognizing uh, changes in the shape of the face that indicated underlying emotional states. Um, but it was around that time when uh, it when the hardware became available and it was feasible to actually do this outside of uh, the kind of supercomputing resources that I used to have available back when I was um, working in computational neuroscience in, in, in graduate school. Um, it became feasible suddenly to um, do this on uh, publicly available hardware um, in the cloud, et cetera, and with uh, super high performance um, computing resources that were previously only available um, at the cost of billions of dollars to governments. And so I, I leveraged those and uh, my training in this space to build uh, quite a large um, deep learning neural network um, that has achieved um, state of the art accuracy in this task of automated facial expression recognition. And what that does for us is now we have not only filled in that hole of how do we understand uh, that real time response to me to media? How exactly are people um, responding as they are consuming um, a narrative or a, a piece of creative um, in real time? And how can that help us to explain the impact um, that exposure to creative has on their behavior or their decision making um, afterwards in a way that doesn't rely on self report? The ideal situation for using the facial action coding system is when someone is um, sitting uh, alone and consuming media um, from a distance um, in isolation where they don't have to think about what people around them are going to think um, when they respond to a narrative in a certain way. If they laugh at a joke um, that they think is funny and someone sitting in the same room might not think it's funny, um, they might repress that in a social situation. Uh, but when they're alone watching media, everyone's um, facial expressions, when they're experiencing a small set of emotions, uh, are quite similar. And that's been proven out over hundreds of studies over the last several decades, starting with uh, Paul Ekman in the 70s. Now, critically, though, this is an application. Um, this is a technology that we can apply at scale um, remotely and in the person's um, home or on the device uh, that they typically consume that media on. So now we have real-time response to um, creative in the home or on the road, um, on a laptop, on a desktop, uh, and the ability to record facial expressions of emotion with high accuracy um, through a webcam. A lot of people consume their content digitally nowadays, so that's their natural viewing environment, which is where they're going to be seeing ads on air and making decisions about what they're going to go shopping for. This is the thing that's been missing all along, right? Is our ability to um, get an objective read on real time response to um, ad exposure, media exposure um, at home among a representative sample you know how does this ad make people feel in real time and um how can we use that information we need that information um as diagnostic tool uh, to understand why an ad had had the impact that it had on preference for our product or a brand whether people remembered it or not um whether the the narrative was connecting with the audience telling the story we wanted to tell right if you want to know understand how people are digesting the narrative that you're putting in front of them, whether they're actually engaging with it emotionally, which we know um, is uh, a major driver of change in attitude or change in preference toward a product or a service or, or an issue. Um, you want to know if they're following along with the narrative in the way that you are laying it down. You want to know, do they have, are they getting the joke? Um, if I'm telling a sad story, are they sad at the appropriate time? Do they get um, the story that I'm trying to tell them and uh, are they responding to it in the way that that I want them to. If I think that something's tragic and I put it on the screen and everyone laughs at it instead of um, feeling um, empathetic to the character, that's probably you know not a good thing and I want to rethink how I'm going to make that ad. I think it's really important to consider that 
many things in science require the application of science and scientific method because they're not obvious. So to say that something like facial expression recognition doesn't jive with one's own intuitions about whether or not it is easy or uh, difficult or whether or not you as an individual without the scientific training required to understand and apply the facial action coding system is not an argument against the science itself. One of the objections that we often hear is, well, I'm, I sit around and watch television with my family at home and I'm watching their faces while we're watching a movie together and I can't, I can't tell how they feel. Well, that's no surprise in general. Um, untrained human beings are not great at telling how other people feel um, with a very high degree of accuracy beyond um, the more basic and communicative of the facial expressions. Untrained individuals are not particularly accurate at recognizing facial expressions of emotion. It take, takes quite a bit of expertise and it takes quite a bit of understanding and it takes a heck of a lot of hard studying um, to understand how to use it properly and um, how to uh, see the motions in the face because there are these extremely specific um, set of changes in the appearance of the face that can occur um, because we know that there are um, 42 or 43, depending on how you count, muscles in the face that affect the shape of the face. Even in ideal circumstances, like the circumstances we have here during, when we're uh, doing ad testing um, online in this really ideal um, environment for uh, deploying FACS at scale, we still don't want to um, whittle down our sample size to one or even you know 16 or 20 or, or 32. Um, because even though we are in a much more advantageous um, laboratory conditions like environment um, where uh, the application of FACS is strongly supported. Um, it's still the case that uh, a facial expression of emotion is not always going to be present on the face every time that an individual experiences an emotion. So for example, um, Someone might find a joke funny, but not that funny. And the 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 degree to which um, it makes them uh, happy or makes them laugh um, doesn't rise to the level of it appearing on their face in um, in a strongly evident way. Um, and so even when people are um, experiencing the, the majority of your emotional experience, in fact, I would say, um, does not is not accompanied by um, a facial expression that's that's recognizable either by untrained individuals or by FACS. Uh, it's only when emotion is being relatively strongly felt, um, which is not a particularly high bar, uh, the percentage of times that uh, facial expression of emotion appears um, is related to the strength of the stimulus that it's responding to. You know, how funny was the joke? How sad is the story? Um, how disgusting is that, you know, questionable piece of food? Um, and that's a very difficult thing to um, standardize and, and, and replicate. Um, so it's not uh, the case that a facial expression of a particular emotion is going to appear on the face 100% of the time. Uh, one of the things that you need to understand about reading facial expressions is that, yes, there are some cultural influences on facial expressions in public and um, in certain situations, in tense situations, in anxiety provoking situations like in court or um, at the airport in front of TSA. Um, or in, a, in an interaction with the police on the street. These are all situations in which um, uh, facial expression, uh, the recognition of facial expressions using facial action coding system um, are not are invalid. These are situations in which um, you do not want to use 
um, fa uh, facial action coding system to infer um, someone's mental state because a um, they're in a very uh, they're in a unique mental state. Um, and the reasons why those use cases are um, invalid is not just uh, down to the method or um, the parameters around reliability of reading facial expressions at the individual level, but because of the enormous social pressures involved in those situations and um, the high risk nature of those kinds of situations. Um, it's very easy for someone who's completely innocent of everything to be very concerned um, that something bad might happen to them um, when they have a run in with authority like that. And it makes people nervous. And unfortunately, um, the outward expressions of anxiety are very easily misinterpreted as indications of guilt. Um, so it's really important to be aware of the fact that in these um, situations of heightened stress, especially heightened stress with a social interaction component um, like that, um, that it is much, much more difficult to uh, assign a useful meaning to facial expressions. On the other hand, if you're staring at someone's face intently and uh, attempting to read their emotions, now they have uh, motivation to either uh, use to modify their facial expressions in a way that they think that you personally will understand with uh, your own cultural context or their personal experience with you, um, or they're motivated to alter their facial expressions uh, in an attempt to hide their feelings. So it's critically important to understand the difference between facial recognition and the automated recognition of facial expressions. Um, why is that important? Well, all over the world right now, um, people are rightly becoming very concerned about automated facial recognition. So your face has a unique configuration of distances between the corners of your eyes and the tip of your nose and the bridge of your nose and uh, the corners of your mouth, for example. Those fiducial points um, is what they're called, or landmarks on your face uh, that are recognizable uh, by machine learning algorithms um, do have a unique configuration for um, each individual. And it's probably the case that this is um, about as unique as a fingerprint, meaning that there are there are it is possible to make mistakes. It is possible to misidentify someone from their um, facial uh, features. And we've seen this happen actually. There are very real dangers to the use of facial recognition, and I'm glad that governments around the world are um, stepping in and and making and attempting to uh, regulate the use of facial recognition um, so that people aren't, um, you know, so that we're not all living in a surveillance state. Now, unfortunately, many of them are confusing facial recognition and the automated uh, recognition of facial expressions. And there's a very big difference. The big difference is that automated facial expression recognition um, is not concerned with uh, measuring uh, or, ident or uh, uniquely identifying a configuration of landmarks on your face um, and simply tracking the configuration of those landmarks and cataloging the configuration of those landmarks. Um, instead, appearance-based, um, neural network-based, deep learning-based, um, automated facial expression recognition algorithms of the kind that are have the highest performance in terms of um, FACS-based accuracy. Uh, are not concerned with um, deliberate measurement of uh, from point to point on your face, um, but with the overall appearance of, of the face and specifically changes in the shape of the face caused by the contraction of muscles. Facial expression recognition when it's used properly um, is, is a tool 
um, that comes from the neurosciences and, and psychological behavioral sciences that uh, can be done well and can be done um, uh, at scale online uh, with a representative population. What we have in the world we live in today is people consuming media on digital devices on their own at home. Uh, and not only that, but we they have webcams on their computers where if they opt in to uh, participating in a, in a study and turning that webcam on, we have a direct view of their face, which is the ideal viewing angle um, and uh, close and angles much far off of this are actually prohibited um, from scoring in the FACS system because you're unable to see parts of the face that you need to see in order to develop a, a full picture of someone's facial expression and determine whether it suggests that they're experiencing a particular emotion. If you're using um, facial expression recognition for marketing research, you should be using a system that is equally capable as uh, human FACS coders um, in an equal number of situations on the same breadth of demographics and race and gender, et cetera. You need to have a mechanism um, to help your respondents um, be in a position that's advantageous for um, automated facial expression recognition. And for that, we use a machine learning model um, that is really in place mainly to um, give feedback to respondents to make sure that that when they do opt in and turn on their webcam, um, that we are able to see their face well enough that our AI-driven um, models uh, will be able to score their face accurately according to the facial action coding system, and we can we can infer accurately um, whether or not they're experiencing a certain emotional response at a certain time as they're watching a piece of media. The facial expression um, recognition AI uh, that we have running offline in a secure cloud environment are going to be able to get a good result from this image of this respondent's face that we're not wasting their time, we're not wasting our time. This is the key thing. This is what's been missing for the last, you know, 80, 100 years of marketing research is understanding how people are responding in real time so that we can understand why our ad had this impact or failed to have this impact. It's complementary to other metrics. So nowadays we have uh, quite sophisticated methods and technologies for um, gauging the, the actual impact of uh, marketing on consumer behavior, um, both uh, through predictive choice modeling, and we can combine it with uh, eye tracking. So not only do we get the real-time emotional response to narrative, we also get to see, we get insight into um, you know, where their attention is directed uh, in an ad as, as it moves along. A lot of people will lose track of a narrative because the character that they're supposed to be focusing on um, is obscured or there's another character on the screen who's drawing too much attention away from them um, and the audience might miss out on some important interaction. And we need to be able to see that, that their emotional response um, in real time is related to um, what their eyes are attending to at the same time. Um, but also by the ability to measure uh, marginal lift um, from campaigns um, in the wild, so to speak, or online um, through click tracking and et cetera. Um, so attribution um, is the technology for attribution is there. The technology for prediction um, with greater and greater accuracy is also there. Uh, and certainly the real time response to uh, media exposure um, contains some predictive um, information as well, and especially when it comes to um, measurement of uh, of either cognitive or emotional engagement um, during real time media exposure. Uh, but really, when you have the ability to um, dissect that uh, emotional engagement um, moment by moment um, in real time without interfering with that experience that the uh, of media consumption, um, and you can dissect it into uh, multiple uh, discrete emotions and uh, valence as well as overall emotional engagement. Um, now you can begin to understand um, specifically what it was and wasn't about the narrative content that people uh, were responding to. So there's enormous diagnostic um, value in facial action coding data, uh, especially when it comes to uh, specific questions like what emotions were evoked um, did people actually get 
the joke or were people actually um, made uh, sad in empathy with the character who's at the center of some tragic circumstance or were they um, did they find an advertisement for something like say Mint Mobile's Chunky Milk ad um, to be paradoxically both uh, disgusting but also hilarious um, and when you look at uh, the data for for an advertisement like that one, um, you get the chance to see that, yes, you can actually have these conflicting emotions in the sense that they appear at different times during the ad and sometimes together. Um, but that diagnostic value is huge, so you can understand why that ad was engaging and what the narrative arc was that the respondents were actually um, following along with. What were they paying attention to and responding to in that um, piece of creative that led to a change in their attitudes or the change in their in their likelihood to purchase. Use a sample size is equivalent to any other quantitative method. This is a critical one that leads to a lot of misunderstandings because we have people out there saying that facial action coding, facial expression recognition, uh, even using the proper methodology of FACS isn't effective. And then it turns out that they're only testing, you know, 10 or 15 people and they're trying to project that out to a large population and they're doing it in a laboratory situation. That makes no sense. Every other methodology that you deploy, you use representative samples because you understand statistics and you understand that in order to project out to what your ad is going to do when it's released to a larger population, you need a statistically significant uh, or statistically meaningful um, sample size in order to make an accurate and a prediction that's accurate, you know, that's accurate enough for to be useful to you. So to summarize what we've talked about today, modern state of the art FACS compliant uh, automated facial expression recognition systems um, using artificial intelligence finally are allowing brands to get objective scientific insight into the real time audience response to media across representative samples of consumers and audiences. It allows you to identify why and how creative content connects, develop marketing principles and creative best practices, optimize your content for various platforms and in various formats, improve the effectiveness of your communications, and avoid making a costly mistake by putting an ad in, in market that doesn't resonate with audiences. Thank you for joining today. I'm Jeremy Clough, the SVP of Brand and Product Strategy at Sentient, and I want to thank Dr. Cyrus McCandless for his expertise on the use of FACS for creative professionals. We have uh, more info on FACS available in our paper online that you can access, and it's also a handout um, within this webinar, and you can access it within the control panel. Uh, we have time for some questions. Um, Cyrus, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Um, here's a couple. These are actually some good questions. Um, can FACS be used to detect subtle or um, micro expressions online? And how reliable is it in capturing these uh, nuances? Um, that question always makes me wonder what the motivation of the person asking the question is. Uh, I guess maybe that, how accurate um, is it? Sure, sure, sure. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, but usually, when people ask that question, their um, their their uh, interest comes from the point of view of someone looking to um, gauge the response of an individual. So, for deception detection um, or for interviewing, for example. Um, and those are really tricky situations in which to use um, FACS. So the the real um the answer is yes it um can be um used that way online there are some technical limitations so uh, micro expressions um being defined as uh, expressions of emotion that happen at, at under about one fifteenth of a second um, means that you have to have a higher um, frame rate than that you have to have a really reliable video feed um, we do use a higher frame rate than that but um it, it means that you're going to capture those micro expressions in one or two frames of video. Um, and it, when it comes to applications like deception detection or uh, interviewing, those are inherently um, 
uh, social context, right? Those are high pressure um, situations, which I talked about um, a bit earlier. And so I really want to caution people um, against relying on um, automated FACS as, uh, you know, 100% reliable um, for at the individual level, especially in those kinds of high state situations. But certainly it's possible, certainly it can add a meaningful data feed um, to a larger and more robust, well thought out sort of individual analysis situation. Uh, here's another good one. We usually get this question a lot. Um, what are the ethical considerations related to the use of FACS, especially in areas like privacy or consent? Um, so, yeah, we, we do get that question a lot. What are your... What yeah, are your I mean, obviously, the what I just talked about um, is related to that question and that, you know, when if it's misapplied, and especially if it's misapplied at scale, like in automated, you know, AI-based, um, automated interviews, um, it can, there are a number of, of ethical um, problems um, that need to be addressed um, very carefully there. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, coming from academic research with human subjects, I'm always a huge advocate of, of uh, informed consent. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, GDPR and making sure that, that you're providers to DPR compliant and that they're not retaining um, the images of individuals. Um, but otherwise, you know, if you're comfortable with the ethics around photography or video conferencing or, um, you know, other sorts of um, situations that are very common today of, of, you know, having images of your face taken, um, there are no particularly, um, you know, different uh, ethical considerations um, other than the fact that you're participating in a scientific study for some kind of um, either commercial or academic purpose and and that always deserves um, you know human subjects protection. All right Cyrus thank you very much we've gone over um, I appreciate everybody for joining and you can look out for this recording online. Thanks again Cyrus. Thank you thanks Jeremy. Th Bye. Thanks everyone.